Percy Shelley. Here we go with Percy Shelley. So he is also a neoclassicist, similar to Byron. There's a picture of him there. He was a romantic poet who lived from 1792 to 1822. Um, his full name is Percy Bushy Shelley, and his father was a member of parliament, so he was born into an upper class family um, in a kind of like a suburb of London. He was born in Sussex and um, he went to Eton. This is a famous private school, still a famous private school in England. And while he was there, um, because he was kind of unathletic, he was very slender and kind of known to be an eccentric um, boy, like imaginative, just had an, an extreme imagination. Um, he was teased a lot and he was called Mad Shelley. The other boys at the school would call him Mad Shelley. Um, so he goes on, it's like this is how he starts his life out, just kind of not being accepted by the norm. In 1810, he goes to Oxford University. And while he's there in the first probably six months, he writes a pamphlet that he distributes called The Necessity of Atheism. So kind of radical. And because of that, he's expelled from Oxford within the first year, just because that was pretty out there, pretty pretty radical. Um, when he's 18, he meets and falls in love with Harriet Westbrook. Um, his parents and her parents were not happy that they got married, so they said, like, we cut you off. We're not going to support you anymore. So they were very poor, and um, they go to Ireland to kind of work for... Catholic emancipation. They go to Ireland to like be part of a cause um, while he's there. And then when he comes back, um, PB becomes a member of the radical society um, with Mary Wollstonecraft. Mary Wollstonecraft is considered the first feminist. So Mary Wollstonecraft and William Goodwin, another radical philosopher, um, their daughter, her name is Mary, falls in love with PB. So PB is hanging out with William Goodwin. He's hanging out with Mary Wollstonecraft, with a bunch of radical philosophers, and he falls in love with their daughter, Mary. She probably was about 16 at the time. He would have been in his mid-20s. Um, falls in love with her, and they actually um, run away together. He's still married. They go live in France together for a couple of years. He returns to England, an outcast, because he's been living with one woman, married to another woman. So England doesn't treat him very well. Um, so he decides, you know, in 1816 to go live on the shores of Lake Geneva. And then while he's living there, he becomes friends with Lord Byron. And there's a picture of Lake Geneva. It's very beautiful. Um, so he's living there with Mary while his wife is left behind and he tries to get custody of children or at least partial custody of the children that he had with Harriet and he is denied that because he's still married to her, he's living with another woman. Pretty scandalous. Um, in 1818, he finally marries Mary Shelley and they elope actually, like take off in the night and she leaves and her parents are not happy that she's marrying him. And they move to Italy. Um, they live in Italy for four years. While they're there, they have two children who die. Eventually, they have four children who die. But while they're living um, in Italy, two of their children die. Um, he writes Promethe Prometheus Unabound or Unbound. This is one of um, this is one of the best. I guess, pieces that he's known for. Um, while he's there, he creates a multitude of great poetry. He writes a lot of different poems. Ode to the West Wind is very famous. Um, there are so many that, I, you know, I don't need you to know all of them, but he's writing a ton of poetry while they're living in Italy. Um, in 1822, he and a friend set out in a small boat named the Don Juan, and he drowns in a storm. So he's not very old, um, he leaves his wife behind. He leaves behind um, his two children with Harriet. 
but after he died, he's remembered as one of the best artists to have lived in England. People have said, you know, he was so imaginative. He was a genius. He just didn't live long enough to necessarily realize his genius. Um, one of the pieces that I'm going to give to you to read for him is Ozymandias. This is one of my favorite poems from him. Um, I'm going to read it to you and I'll just talk to you a little bit about it. It says, I met a traveler from a an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert near them on the sand half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocks them and the heart that fed and on the pedestal these words appear my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. No thing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. The lone level stand, stre sands stretch far away. So um, if we go to the very beginning, we have the speaker. The speaker says, I met a traveler. And the traveler actually says back to the speaker, two vast and trunk two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. So the traveler is telling the speaker, hey, in the desert, there are these two trunkless legs of stone standing in the desert, like they don't have a body, they're just two legs of stone. So it's probably pretty ancient. And it says, near them, on the sand, so laying on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage. A visage is our face, like um, our eyes and face and this visage is lying there it's probably an old piece of stone with a face on it um, frowning with a wrinkled lip and a sneer of cold command and that's laying there and it says whoever sculpted this um, the passions read like which yet survived stamped on these lifeless things so when you look at this statue you can tell something about the people who lived here at that time the hand that mocks them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. So on the pedestal of the statue, this is what it reads. So now we get our third speaker. Um, it says, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. No thing beside remains. So he says like, I am the mightiest king. Look here, everything that I make is strong and it's going to last forever and then at the very end we see like well nothing is left N nothing is left this guy's empire isn't left um his all that's left is this broken up statue so the moral of this poem then if you think about it first of all we have three speakers and all of them are kind of learning this lesson as we go but at the very end of it the empires that we build, the things that we think are going to live on and on, they aren't remembered. They will pass away like sand, like this trunkless statue in the desert. It's a pretty profound poem with metaphors, with three different narrators. Um, we'll talk more about it when we look at P.V. Shelley together, but I wanted you to have a kind of a basic knowledge of what's going on with him. So. Anyway, um, we'll learn more about P.B. Shelley together. I hope you find this poem entertaining. Let's see here. There we